Today on Parent Connection, a conversation about our school calendar. Hello and welcome to another edition of Parent Connection. I'm your host, Jen Lombardi. During today's show, we are going to learn about the creation of the school calendar. Bob Mosier, Chief Communication Officer for Anne Arundel County Public Schools, has joined us today because he facilitates the calendar development process for Anne Arundel County Public Schools. He will help us better understand the ins and outs of how the calendar is created. Welcome, Bob. Thanks. Great to be here. So appreciate you being here. Sure. Many people remember a long time ago when we were kids that we used to have off, it seemed like a whole week for Christmas, a whole week into spring, and we had off just a lot of days. Yeah. So the calendar's changed a lot over the years and uh, new implementations of state law, uh, new requirements uh, from school system employee bargaining units, all of those types of things play into what we have to take into account when we create the school calendar. I like to think of it as a huge jigsaw puzzle and you have to arrange pieces to, to make it best work for students. So what I think I'm hearing is there's some um, Anne Arundel County doesn't have 100% autonomy in creating the calendar how Anne Arundel County wants to do it. Well, no school system has 100% autonomy okay. because there are things in state law that you're required to do. But most people remember a few years ago when the governor signed an executive order that mandated that schools began after Labor Day and finished by June 15th. And so we all adjusted our calendars to that and that created some consternation for some people and a lot of changes. That was recently undone by the General Assembly and so schools have that portion of the autonomy back. So schools are free to create their calendars in terms of beginning when they want and ending when they want, but they still have to meet certain stipulations in the law. For example, you have to have 180 school days for students, right? Your uh, employee bargaining units have to uh, have a certain number of contracted work days. Here in Anne Arundel County, our teachers work 191 days. Mm. So the 180-day school day calendar has to match up with the 191-day teacher year calendar, right? So that's what I mean by the jigsaw puzzle piece. Okay, so um, so it's actually state law that had changed. So to help us or to provide for us, we would not go back before Labor Day. Right. And now that has changed back. What are some of the other things in state law besides the 180 days? So there's a minimum number of days for students, 180. Uh -huh. There's a minimum number of seat hours for students, 1,080 okay. at the elementary and the middle school levels, slightly more than that at the high school level. Uh, and then there are required days that school systems have to be closed. For example, school systems are closed on Easter Monday uh, and school systems are closed from Christmas Eve through New Year's Day. So to open on any of those days, you would need a waiver from the State Department of Education. So actually the State Department of Education tells us, or the law tells us, we cannot decide to go to school on any of those days. Right. We could, we could desire to go to school on Easter Monday. And okay. in fact, we opened on an Easter Monday a few years ago. We got a waiver to do so. Uh, but you can't just build your calendar with, example, opening on Easter Monday. Okay. So from what I'm hearing, it sounds like that there's state laws. And then you also talked a little bit about bargaining units. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things in the bargaining units, such as the teachers union? What have they bargained for? Right. So here in Anne Arundel County, we have four employee bargaining units. They're basically teachers, mm -hmm. administrators, secretaries and assistants, and then our maintenance workers and our food service workers. And each of them have negotiated agreements with our Board of Education. And in those negotiated agreements are clauses that dictate things like work hours and work year and those types of things. So for teachers, for example, as I mentioned, it's a 191 day work year, but also in their negotiated agreement is a stipulation that there has to be one non-school day between the first semester and the second semester. So when we go to build the calendar and work the pieces of that puzzle, we have to leave a day in which no students are in school between the second marking period and the third marking period. So that means, say we have a snow day or, or say we have this big storm in December. Mm -hmm. We um, never have that. <laughs> but if we did, um, and we were already behind on our snow days and um, we wanted to try to add an additional day, we couldn't add that day in between the, the two semesters? Correct, because it's negotiated, right? Okay. You, you, can't, you have to have one non-student day there because that's part of the teacher's association agreement. In fact, if you have 
snow on the last day of the second marking period, right? We have slid the marking period before and to accommodate quarterly assessments and those kinds mm -hmm. of things, and then you still have to have one day where students are not in school between the second and the third marking period. Okay. And what do teachers do on that day? Why would the bargaining unit want that day? So it's a work day for teachers, but at the high school level and at the middle school level, really they use it to close out the second marking period or the first semester mm -hmm. and begin to get ready for the second semester where in most cases they have a whole new set of students. So if I was teaching high school and I had, um, let's say, a caseload, I don't know, 150 students, mm -hmm. well, next semester I have a whole 150 new students, so I need a day to prepare myself to determine who's on my roster. And That's correct. Yeah, you're, you're, okay. you're doing the final closeout of your grades from the mm -hmm. first semester and getting things ready for students who will be in your class in the second semester. Well, that certainly makes sense of why they would want that day. Right. And so, um, and then now I think our parents probably have a good understanding of why that day is built in. Are there other, um, I know, early dismissals? We have mm -hmm. some early dismissals built in between um, semesters. Right. So, so well, between uh, the last two marking days periods. of each yes. of our four Thank marking you. periods are two hour early dismissals. Those are intended to allow teachers to complete grades, again, in time for report cards and those kinds of things. So, we've gone from um, two days in the first and the third marking period and four days in the second and the fourth marking period in terms of early dismissals to two in each of the four marking periods because we moved from semester exams to quarterly assessments. So when we did that, we didn't need the four days at the end of the second and fourth marking periods anymore, which I think parents appreciate. And, and that makes a lot of sense of, of why now we have two at the end of each marking period right. because they were the days that were at the end of the semesters. Correct. Okay. Well, that really helps us understand some of the limitations that is not giving us autonomy. But after that, and we really, we know what limits us and we have a skeleton built, what's the process that we would then use to actually build a calendar? Yeah, well, that's a great anymore? analogy, building the skeleton first, right? So you have the non-negotiables in terms of what the calendar committee or the superintendent or the board could work with, right? So mm -hmm. the day between semesters is the easy example. Easter Monday, you have to be closed. Christmas Eve, you have to be closed. Those kinds of things. So what happens in the process here in Anne Arundel County is the superintendent develops a recommended calendar and it presents, he presents it to the calendar committee. So the calendar committee is made up of 14 um, representatives from uh, employee bargaining units, mm -hmm. from two parent organizations and two students. Okay. So we have employees from each of our four bargaining units and then we have folks from the Countywide Citizen Advisory Committee, from the County Council of PTAs, and then two students from CRASC who are, are very valuable to us. And then we have nine folks from different departments throughout our school system representing testing and instructional data and human resources and negotiations and athletics because that's a big part of this. So the superintendent's recommendation goes to the calendar committee and then they have the purview to alter it as they see fit as long as it meets all of those state requirements that we just talked about. It is the calendar committee's recommendation that goes forward to the Board of Education and the board can then accept it as is or make alterations to it. Okay, so I, I hear how you're getting every voice heard with the calendar committee with all the different groups. What about parent input for the general? I mean, we have 84,000 students. All those parents, how do they give input besides within the calendar so committee? So there's a couple of different ways. So the calendar committee is a representative group, right? It, okay. it's, not, it's not every parent sitting in a room weighing in, right? That would be impossible. So you have this representative group who comes up with a consensus of what the calendar should look like. Then the calendar is presented to the board first as an information review item only. Okay. The board reviews it. We do a presentation for the board that lays out exactly what the superintendent recommended, exactly what the calendar committee is recommending, and whether there are any differences there. And so that's at one meeting and then come back at the next meeting, which is typically two weeks later, okay. and the board will then take the item up again and take action on it. At either of those meetings is a session for public comment where, where the public can come weigh in. The public could then email uh, the board, they could call the board, they could write the board in some other way. Um, but we make very public what the calendar committee's recommendation is. It's on our website. Uh, it's on our social media pages so that everybody can understand it and weigh in with the board before they take that action step. Okay, so let me just clarify to make sure I understand. So if I'm a parent, I can actually go on the website, see the draft, 
after it's been presented the first time for information. Correct. And if I feel very strongly about something um, in the calendar that does not violate one of the laws mm -hmm. or the negotiated agreements of any of the unions, I could come and speak to that at the board meeting and the board members would hear my perspective of what I would like. Right, so let's take um, a real example from this year, right? So one of the big debates was whether we start before Labor Day or after Labor Day. The board okay. ultimately decided to start after Labor Day. The calendar committee decided to recommend starting before Labor Day. If you believe strongly in one of those or the other, you could certainly come to the board or you could email the board and not come to a meeting if you're okay. unable to attend and express your views on that so that they have your input before they get to that action meeting. Okay, um, so after that action meeting, then it's public and then it's finalized. And the only thing that would change that afterwards is if there's another state law like the one that, that changed it last time. Yes, Hopefully. maybe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, maybe. So uh, the board can change the calendar at any point. Oh. Um, it's, it's not once it's final, it's final. Typically, that's how it works okay. because the board is very aware that parents want a set document from which they can then begin to plan family activities, vacations, all those kinds of things. Uh, there are times, though, when the board will come back to a calendar uh, for one reason or another. Um, and, and there are day, there are times when you know we might have to do so for weather, right? That's an extreme circumstance. Um, but uh, you know it just depends on what the conversation of the day is. And so there was a lot of conversation, as I mentioned, in, in recent years about pre-Labor Day and post-Labor Day. Um, and so when the board ends up adopting a calendar, more often than not, it's basically final, is how I would okay. put it, right? I mean, there could be some tweaks to it. Right. So if we used all of our snow days that are already built in, there might be a tweak towards the end of the school year in order if, if the state doesn't give us a waiver. Correct. And so we would come back to the board if um, we had to go ask a waiver of the state, for example, right? Because in our calendar, we build in language that says we have two snow days built in and we've set aside a third day as a conditional third day. So if we need that third day, it's usually in March, but let's just say we had seven snow days before mm -hmm. we get to March, oh, no. right? And so then we've got to do something, right? right. And so typically we, put, we would put those days on the end of the calendar. Okay. Um, but if you're in a situation where you only build in three and you've got seven, you know, then we're going to talk about waivers and that kind of stuff with the state. All of that would happen in, basically in a public session before the board. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Now, a uh, quick question. I know some people have talked about year-round schools. Mm -hmm. um, has that ever come up with the calendar committee? Or? Never come up with the calendar committee. Okay. I mean, people talk about year-round schools um, a lot, and, and um, you know, especially around the country. I've been at conferences around the country where this has come up. Um, it's never gained a lot of traction, you know, to my knowledge here in Maryland. Um, it would have to be, I would think, a statewide thing. Um, you couldn't have a situation, I don't think, where Anne Arundel County could do year-round school. Not that we're considering doing it, but right. just hypothetically. And Baltimore County doesn't, right? And the easiest example I would give you is how would your athletic schedules line up, right? Mm -hmm. Where would your football season be? And so you can play state playoffs and those kinds of things. Where would your, you know, your science fairs be where you, know, you, can, you have people from other counties involved and that kind of stuff? So logistically, it would be really difficult, I would think, to do it if you didn't do it statewide. Well, that really makes the analogy of a jigsaw. I mean, right. that, it's a true jigsaw. Yeah. Now, there are some things that are built in the calendar that are not required by state law mm -hmm. and um, just um, moved forward because Anne Arundel County thinks that they're good things to do, mm -hmm. such as parent-teacher conferences right. and professional development. Right. Um, can you explain a little bit more to me about how they're built into sure. the Sure, so obviously we value parent-teacher conferences greatly mm -hmm. and we want parents to be involved. Uh, and so we build in time for parent-teacher conferences. That's taken a lot of different forms over the years. Uh, it used to be several years ago, we did them the first two days of Thanksgiving week. And so there were no students in school uh, for all of Thanksgiving week. We've changed that up in recent years where we, we now have one day for parent, we had one day for parent-teacher conferences in each of the first two marking periods and then one in the third marking period for students changing classes in the second semester there. Mm -hmm. And so this year we had uh, two, two days in October for elementary schools and one day in October for our high schools. Uh, and so, because our elementary schools needed more time to, to sit with, with more parents. And so, 
Um, it's really important and has been important to the board, um, but there's no state law governing A, if you have to dedicate time to them, or B, if you do, what kind of time you, know, you have to dedicate to it. Does it have to be a full day off for students? Can it be a two hour early dismissal? Those are all conversations that you would have within a, a given school system. So from what I'm hearing, so the, is, was the rationale to move them from the week in November earlier to, to provide more support for students? Yeah, absolutely more okay. support for students. And so we tried to um, put one in each of the first three marking periods. Uh -huh. And then elementary principals uh, had a conversation with the superintendent and said, look, we don't have enough time in a single day to bring all of our parents through here. Those conferences are typically longer than a middle school conference or a high school conference. And so is there a way that we can make this work? And so we made it work by the fact that our high school, we had a 181 day calendar. You only need 180, remember we talked right. about that earlier. We had a 181 day calendar because we close our high schools on the days of their graduations. And so they have 180 days, but the elementaries had 181. So we converted the 181st to another parent-teacher conference day to help that need. Oh, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And then second semester, that, that conference day in March or in the spring, right. um, is because all the teachers that high school student might have had in the fall, they might have totally different classes right. or totally different teachers. Right, and, and so if I'm, a, if I'm a student who doesn't have you as a teacher in the first semester, and, and we want my parents involved, right? They've got no way to have that conference, no formal way to have that conference with you without the one in the third marking period. Okay, mm -hmm. and I guess you say 180 days for the state law for mm -hmm. kids to be in school mm -hmm. in the number of hours. Mm -hmm. So these parent-teacher conferences don't count as school days because the kids are not in school. Right, and so that impacts the end of the school year. So every day you want to close school for students, mm -hmm. you extend the school year one more day. Right? So if you have a two-hour early dismissal on which you're going to have parent-teacher conferences, that counts as a school day, and I don't need to move the end of the school year by day. But when I close for students on this day, I have to make it up somewhere. I have to make that day up somewhere. Okay. That's the same conversation that happens around Easter spring break. Right? So if Easter spring break is three days, which we in this county have had for several years, right? Mm -hmm. Thursday, Friday, Monday. Now, Monday we have to close, and actually Friday we have to close also. Uh -huh. Those are by state law, but we don't have to close on the Thursday before Easter, okay. and some counties don't. But So we have that three-day spring break. If we want to make that a six-day spring break and close on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we have to find those other three days somewhere in the calendar. Okay, and then um, I just have one other question. Um, so I hear that it's 180 days, but they also count hours. Right. So if we had a lot of delayed openings, mm -hmm could that impact our calendar it potentially? Could, it could definitely impact the calendar, not in terms of days, but in terms of hours, right? Okay. So, so we are way above the minimum number of hours at the elementary and middle school levels. Mm -hmm. And we are pretty safely above it at the high school level. But if we had a dozen days on which we had to open two hours late, we might run into a problem there. And there are other counties that have run into that problem. Oh, okay. um, so we, have to, we do watch that and we track it. Um, what people fail to understand sometimes as we talk about the calendar is they say, well, we could get out earlier if you didn't have these two-hour early dismissal days. Well, that's not true because the two-hour early dismissal day still counts as a school day. So whether we're getting out two hours earlier or going the full school day, it doesn't move the end of the school year. At okay, all. And, and we already have enough hours, so... Right. Right. Why add those hours when you're actually providing professional development for right. teachers? Because that's right. That's right. Okay. And, and so four of those days are the equity professional development days uh -huh. that we spend a lot of time on and, and focus on in this county. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I really think that that really helped me and I, th I hope our audience understand how the calendar is developed. Um, Bob, I really appreciate no, your time. It's great to be here. Great Thank you here. so much. Thank you. The Writing on the Walls course was designed to create an exciting experience for students who might not normally consider taking an art course. We examine modern artists in a modern material and we encourage students to find their voice and tell their story through their work. Writing on the Walls is such a fun class. It's a fun way to approach art. This was the first time I realized I might have some artistic ability. You can have fun and don't have to be a super serious artist to enjoy the class. It's really fast paced and exciting. I love how our murals turned out. I was surprised at how much fun I had and how I was just really able to express myself through the art. Find your voice. Tell your story. Sign up for this course today. Storytelling. Writing on the walls. 
I am here with Dr. Maisha Gillins, Executive Director of Equity and Accelerated Student Achievement for Anne Arundel County Public Schools. We have four early dismissal professional development days built into our calendar. Dr. Gillins is with us today to help us understand what happens in the schools after students go home. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Gillen. Thank you, Ms. Lombardi. We are so excited. I'm sure parents are wondering, so my kid comes home, yes. well, what are the teachers doing? Yes, yes. So what happens? And interestingly enough, I also have two children in the school system, so my own mm -hmm. children always ask me the question, why do we have the early dismissal days? So the four early dismissal days in Anne Arundel County are intended to build teacher capacity and staff capacity, it's training, professional development around equity to ensure that we're elevating all students and eliminating of uh, the achievement and opportunity gaps that we find in some of our students in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. So that's right in line with the strategic plan yeah. and the driving values of Anne Arundel County. Yeah. So is that how you decided um, or the theme was decided upon? Yes, for sure. In support of our strategic plan, all okay. means all. And so we know that in some of our schools that we do have certain student groups who are struggling to meet standards um, alongside other student groups. And one of the foundations of our st strategic plan is relationship building. Oh. So every early dismissal really starts out with that relationship building among staff, so then they can in turn establish positive relationships with their students. So what I think I'm hearing is, um, so this cornerstone of relationship building yes. that is part of the st um, strategic plan, yes. part of the driving values, yes. is professional development is provided for teachers. Yes and to build relationships amongst themselves. Yes. And then they can use that in their classroom to build um, relationships with their students and among their students. Correct. And that benefits every student, Correct. not just students that aren't achieving or that struggling. Correct. That is correct, because again, our goal here is to elevate all students, okay. right, along with eliminating all gaps as well. So you're ab absolutely right. Our focus is for all, all students, all means all, and relationship building, as according to research, shows that students really do prosper and do well when they have um, caring adults and um, fostering positive relationships among the adults in the building and the students and the school community as well. We're talking families, community members that come into buildings and they feel like they're welcomed, that they've established that positive school um, community relationship. Okay. So, uh, the professional development is actually to build teacher skills. Yes, correct. Okay. To have them be better instructional leaders. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Now, does every school do the same professional development? Good question. So, we have many schools in Anne Arundel County yes. Public Schools from northern part of the county, southern part, east, west, et cetera. So, because of that, we wanted to really make sure that we're creating opportunities for school leaders to choose professional development that really, really fits the need of their individual student population. It wouldn't be um, fair or appropriate for us to say, oh, everyone, you know, we're all doing the same thing. Now, however, in the past, we have chosen items like implicit bias mm -hmm. that we did feel like as a district, all employees, all staff at school levels will, could um, benefit from the information on implicit bias. And it can't, again, all cost schools, we did decide to do that. However, for the remainder three early dismissal days, schools do have choice. And what do those choices look like? Certainly, they can range from um, looking at equitable practices. So every um, teacher, we have what we call the teaching and learning cycle. Mm -hmm. These are expectations of what quality teaching looks like every single day. And so what some schools did, they chose that module to really unpack what good teaching looks like as it relates to equitable practices. So an example would be when students enter your room, call them by their, uh, their name and appropriately. Pronunciation of names can be something as simple as having a student feel very welcomed um, in, in your particular classroom. So that's an example for our parents who are watching who might not understand what equitable practices Correct. really, what, what does that look like in action? Correct. Calling a student, um, enunciating their name properly Correct. Is, is, yeah. shows equitable, Correct. equitable practices. Yes. And, it make, okay. and it makes you feel as an individual valued. Mm -hmm. I have a name, my first and my last name are very difficult and difficult to pronounce. And I really do light up when someone can pronounce 
something as simple as pronouncing someone's name. And it also shows the time that's been taken mm -hmm. for the adult to really get to know who their students are and how their names are pronounced. So something is really, really simple and low level as that. That's a good example. Okay. Mm -hmm. So equitable practices and unpacking those is one of the choices yes. a school might have. Yes. What could be another choice? Certainly. Schools? Some schools can choose from, we have um, trauma-informed um, classrooms. We know mm -hmm. that many of our students may be in environments in which trauma is occurring. And trauma can range from a family, um, parents divorcing and a student could be impacted by that. Um, it could be perhaps even substance abuse occurring either in the family or around them and students can be impacted. It could be trauma from students who may have their last meal is at school and may not have the opportunity to have meals when they go home. And so the conversation around the trauma-informed classrooms and school settings is making sure that when all of our students come to school that A, we're not um, creating an environment that will either um, create trauma for a student mm -hmm. or just being very sensitive that our students come to us very, very different, very um, different lived experiences and that we're appropriately addressing it. Whether it be student services being involved, a school counselor, um, whether it be that teacher who knows that you know, the student may not have had a meal last night, making sure that they get what they need to be present for learning. Okay, so mm -hmm. that can look very differently yes. depending upon what the student needs. Yes. It's not necessarily in my classroom, this is an instructional strategy Correct. I do, but just learning about kids and Correct. connecting with kids. That is absolutely right. In their families. Okay. okay. In their families, yeah. Okay, and are there other big rocks for them to choose from as far as professional development? Sure. You have trauma informed, yes. you have the implicit practices. equitable practices uh -huh. and implicit bias. Correct. So are those the main ones that you were doing this year? We have a, about a menu of 10 to oh, 11 wow. different um, options. Another option is what we will call an equity literacy framework. Mm -hmm. And that looks like, we know that again, each school has different um, situations that occur. And so for instance, let's say we have a situation in which a, um, student may need to have uh, earbuds on going out on a fire drill, right? Okay. But if it's a surprise fire drill, do we have that student in an authentic situation? Okay. And so some of the conversation could be really what's best for the student, okay. right? Do we want to cause any um, further um, concern for that student being uneasy about, let's say, the, the, the fire drill going off or the noise. And so the equity literacy framework allows staff to have a conversation that goes very deeply on what's the best for the student oh, wow. at the end of the day. Yeah, because we do, we have, di we, we do encounter different um, issues in our schools, whether it be um, gendered bathrooms, is definitely, we have transgender guidelines mm -hmm. in our district. And so this framework definitely allows us to have um, collegial conversations around tough topics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like it would really support students. Yes, and this is all, all of our early dismissal is to positively impact all of our students in Anne Arundel County. The adults need the training and the practice to make sure that we are meeting the needs of all of our students. Well, um, Dr. Gillings, I really appreciate your time and you being here today because I really think that our audience probably has a much better understanding yes. of what happens yes. when the kids come home and the teachers are still there. That's what are right. they doing? That's so thank right. you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for another edition of Parent Connection. See you next time. The new kindergarten, first, and second grade curriculums are designed to engage students in a variety of learning opportunities that involve cooperation and problem solving. What do I do? Student discourse and structured play develop social foundations through peer interaction. This learning block promotes curiosity, imaginative thought, and responsiveness. The primary focus is on the work of young children, play. The use of tools and materials allow students to share, take turns, 
and develop the confidence to make effective decisions in school and in life. Ask your child how they interacted with their friends today while engaging in structured play.